Welcome everybody to managing conflict and disagreement more effectively. There seems to have been some problem today with Zoom in that I am in glorious isolation here, despite something like 200 people signing up for this webinar. I'm really not sure what's happened, but I thought I would go ahead, record it, and you will all receive a copy of that recording. So I do apologize. I don't, really don't know what on earth has happened. Um, but let's proceed as if you were here. Um, and if you want to ask me any questions about the content after the event, you can find me on LinkedIn. By all means, do message me and ask me any questions. I'd be delighted to hear from you. So uh, moving on then, um, what I was going to do to start today before I really got into the subject was just to let you know about some other events that are going to be on. So Strategy 101 is on Eventbrite now and available to book, and that's on the 20th of October with Tony Kearney. And I'm sure that will be fascinating. I'm looking forward to that. And equally, we have a employment law and HR update, a virtual one on the 1st of November at 4 p.m. And that will be with Julie Temple and her colleagues, Helena and Rihanna. And again, the link is there for you to book onto that. I'm sure there'll be more about that in the branch uh, newsletter on Sunday. So do look out for that. I also wanted on behalf of the CIPD just to refresh your memories about some of the benefits of being a CIPD member. I've been a member for about 30 years now and it's never been better in terms of the package and the benefits you have for your membership fee. And these are just some of them that I thought I would highlight to you today around the career hub and what's available to you, CV building, cover letters, interviews, career assessments, all that sort of thing. Equally career support, there's a webinar series that is available for you to pick up from the website and career web pages. So do have a look at those if you are thinking it's time to look up for a new role, either in your current employer or with somebody new, of course. And then finally, there, there are a number of helplines, well-being being just one of them. And that's available to you, as are these other helplines. And there's a great deal more besides, but I thought it was good to share all of that with you today, just to remind you of that. So moving on then, conflict management and disagreements, because sometimes using the phrase conflict can be off-putting to some people. It sounds so dramatic. Very often when we're talking about problems in countries around the world, we talk about the conflicts there in Afghanistan, Iraq, for it example. And we think, oh, golly, that doesn't quite apply to the sort of issues that I face day to day at work. So I'm using conflict in that gentler sense of the word around disagreements, arguments, difficulties that we may face with other people at work, and which we wish we were better at handling, more adept at handling. And let's have a look today. There are three key things that I want to achieve with you today. Think about how we deal with conflict and difficult situations where we're directly involved and how we behave ourselves. The link between influence, being influential and being able to manage disagreements and arguments more effectively. And then how we can build alliances for support for new initiatives to avoid potential conflicts arising, laying the groundwork more easily for ourselves. So those are the key things that I'm going to go through with you today. Just moving on there. Um, so I was going to ask you for your um, comments and thoughts on this, on what are the benefits of conflict? Does it always mean that it's a negative? Um, and of course it isn't. I'm sure you're well aware that it can be constructive. It can lead to innovation. It can lead to fresh ways of thinking. But it can also be incredibly time consuming and draining, which is why so many of us dread it. But there are benefits. And one of the things I'd like you to do as you're listening to this recording is perhaps stop at this point in time and think about some of the difficult situations that you face at work. What are they? Just jot them down and think about them. And then once we've gone through the slides today, it would be great to go back to those situations of you to stop and think about some of the things that I've talked about, the tips and tools to you to see whether you think they would work for some of those um, situations you face, particularly if they're recurring ones. So make a note of that. 
I'm going to use this model of conflict with you today. It's very well established originally with Thomas Kilman back in the 1970s, but it has yet to be bettered. It's a good, solid uh, model, and it makes it easy to explain what our options are when we're dealing with difficult situations. And you'll see that the key axis is over here on the left-hand side. The degree to which we are willing to be assertive, the degree to which we are prepared to satisfy our concerns, that we need to satisfy our own concerns and we're willing to say so, and the degree along the bottom to which we're willing to be cooperative and satisfy other people's concerns as well. So let's go through these five styles um, and look at the pros and cons of each of them. And I'm going to start off with competing, which is sometimes also called with different variations on this model, directive. So the most important thing to say is that being competitive, as it were, and remember, this is about asserting your needs. And it was in that top left hand corner, but not necessarily being prepared to cooperate or not cooperate to listen to other or satisfy other people's needs. Very much about satisfying your own needs. And that's where it stands. It sounds a very aggressive stance to take, but it doesn't have to be aggressive in the way that we behave when we decide that this is the style that we are going to use on an occasion. But it is very much about being assertive and asserting our position and saying what our needs are and being quite strong and immovable in that. And there can be very solid reasons for this. In HR particularly, you will often come across problems where you have to draw the line that some action or other by a manager would be illegal, it would be breaking the law, it would get the company into difficulties. And so you have to stand the line, as it were, and not give on some situations. So standing your ground, competing, as it were, may be just the sort of thing to do. As an example, when I was working in banking, somebody might come along to my office and say, right, that's it, Amanda. I want so-and-so gone. They're hopeless at their job. I've had enough. I said, oh, okay then. And um, the bonus you gave them last month, where does that fit into all of this? Oh, well, we, we, we did that for everybody. That was just, you know, I just have to do that. And so you would get that sort of scenario. And then it would be a question of just helping them climb down a little, get over that initial feeling of frustration and temper, dare I say it, and start to talk about the reality, what was really going on here. All the while, whilst being polite, and I hope quite charming about it, standing my ground, you can't just fire somebody. So it's important to use in that sort of situation. Self-defense, protecting others is another useful time to use this technique. If you're managing other people and perhaps somebody criticizes a member of your team and it does seem to be completely unfair, it's important that we stand up for our team members. That doesn't mean to say that we never accept that we may have made a mistake or maybe our team members have, but that doesn't mean that we immediately, oh yes, they must be useless if you think they are. It's important that we've got our staffs back and they know that we have, whilst nevertheless being open to listening to whatever issue is being brought to us. It's useful for emergencies, of course. If there's a fire in the building, you don't really want to say, should we have a chat about how we exit the building? You just want people to go and tell them to go in the safest way. So it can be useful at all these sorts of times. It can give you stability when there's uncertainty or indecision. And people don't know what to do and you decide, well, I think this is the best way forward. This is what we're going to do. People very often welcome that. So it has a lot of benefits as a style and is worth considering. It does, however, have disadvantages. Like anything in life, you can have too much of a good thing. The disadvantages are that we may talk more than we listen. Um, in, if we're just asserting what we want and we're not listening to what others want, we are shutting ourselves off from important part, points of view, um, knowledge, information that would help us make a better decision, come to a more um, better, uh, a fully rounded solution to a problem. So by not listening and only being 
um, competitive, we can shut ourselves off to those great ideas, the people that in turn can then spoil the relationships that we have with other people, because if we're like it too often, if we overuse this style, people start to think, oh, what's the point of talking to her? She never listens, so I'm just not going to bother. And then you get that situation, um, as the joke has it, where people come to work, but they leave their brains at the door. Really not much point in, in having that. So you decrease motivation and initiative in other people um, and you lose cooperation and goodwill and you isolate yourself in the process. So those are the disadvantages if we overuse it or make it one of the main styles that we have. So one of the things I'd like you to think about now, make a note of, is how often do you use this style? Put it down as a percentage. And then think about the percentage of time you use it at home or at work. Is there a difference? Why might that be? Very often, if there is a difference, there could be something around the power dynamic that's going on here, whether you feel more or less powerful at work or not, at home or not. If you feel powerless, why is that? What's going on here? And could that be linked to your own sense of self-confidence and self-worth? If you rarely use this tool, this technique to conflict, why is that? Think about what that's telling you about yourself, because if it is around that lack of confidence and self-worth, then you need to fix that first. You need to develop your self-confidence and your sense of worth before you can then begin to handle conflicts more effectively. You can't do the one without the other. Confidence is the absolute bedrock of pretty much everything in life, really. So it's really important that you nurture your self-confidence and you keep it strong. It's easily knocked and it's difficult to recover from. It takes us longer to recover, but it's really important that we do that. And on a scale of one to 10, where 10 is high, you really ideally want to be feeling, on average, most of the time, about an eight. If you're not, then you need to pick yourself up. We don't have time to talk about how you might do that today. I guess that's another conversation. Um, I have a, a blog that I've written before now on that. So if that's something you'd like, then just contact me on LinkedIn and I'll ping that over to you or I'll um, publish it on my profile. If you use it too much, then think about why you're doing that and the disadvantage of it. You might want to start to vary your style a little more often. OK, let's move on to the next one. So this next one, this next style is collaborate. So this was both it was in the top right hand corner. It was high in being assertive, in stating your needs, but also high in listening to other people's needs and wanting to know more about their situation. So this is a curiosity mode, an open mindedness, a willingness to learn, an interest in learning about other people and how they see the world. With that mindset, collaboration is easy. And collaboration is the name of the game these days, isn't it? It's what everybody wants us to be doing. It's what employers uh, really value and they talk about a lot. Do we collaborate? Are we collaborative? It leads to much higher quality decisions, particularly in when you have complex problems. This is a style that's best used for complexity because you need to unpick it to get those optimal um, decisions and solutions to problems. You learn a lot from it, you improve communication, you improve relationships, and people will buy into the resolution that you find together. So it's much more likely that the solution will be successful. So there's a lot of upside to this. However, sorry, I'm just admitting people to the meeting, welcome. I think there may have been some sort of problem. So I've actually already started the seminar. I'm so sorry, I had nobody here at four o'clock. Um, so hopefully you can catch up with me uh, and we'll see how this goes. So um, moving on, disadvantages then to, no, we just covered that. Sorry, we're talking about collaboration um, and where it's best used, but there are disadvantages to collaborating. 
And this is that it takes a lot of time. There's a lot of time and energy required for this. Um, and if you overuse it, you may get to the point where you are ineffective in your role because actually you don't have time for other things. So you need to think carefully about is a situation complex enough that it requires this level of energy and input from a wide range, potentially wide range of people in order to, um, to find an optimal solution. It can be psychologically quite demanding. It requires an openness to new ideas, to being challenged on things that you believe in, to perhaps hear some home truths which are difficult. So you might feel quite challenged by this in terms of your both giving and receiving information, and sometimes that might be uncomfortable, but you will learn a lot in the process. If you work through and come to a solution and it's a sensitive issue and it doesn't work, people may feel very disappointed. They may feel let down by the process when they invested so much. But again, I would argue in a complex situation, it's worth that risk. And it may be that you, you open yourself up to potentially being exploited. Um, there may be a vulnerability risk here. So you may be very open about your situation, about the, the problems that you see, some of the things that you've tried, some of the things that have failed, thinking that in collaboration, those people will respond in kind, but then they don't, and they rather use that openness against you. So there's a potential danger there with collaborating. Overall, it's a very powerful tool when it's used well. So some of the things for you to think about, how often do you use it? Make a note of that for yourself. If you use it a lot, is there a danger that you use it because you are either unhappy making decisions by yourself? There's a little bit of indecisiveness in there. So you're almost using it as support, as it were, when perhaps the situation isn't that complex and really given your expertise, your position in the company, you really could have come to a decision much more quickly and easily yourself by just stating this is what we're going to do, arguably compete mode. Or is it that you like networking, you like making, building relationships with people, there's almost an element of needing to be liked and approved of so you collaborate because that brings you that sense and that feeling of, of, of being liked and approved of. Do you do that a little too much? Maybe there would be times when you would benefit from being a little more independent. So challenge yourself when you think about this, if you think you use it a lot and whether that's quite the right balance. It may be that it is, but I'm just throwing the challenge out there to you. Um, if you seldom use this, again, think about whether that's a good idea and all of the advantages that it can bring you used in the right time and at the right place. Okay, let's move on now, compromising. So this was the square that was in the middle of our model. So you are asserting what your needs are to some extent, you're listening to what other people's needs are to some extent, but not fully. So this is, as you might uh, suggest, a well-known word. It's a kind of a midpoint, potentially a bit of a sticking plaster. It will do for now. It's pragmatic, quick and efficient, fair, and it does maintain relationship. You decide, OK, this isn't great, but it's good enough for now. Let's do that compromise and see where we go from here. And because of that, it can actually be a great tool to use if you use it knowingly as a stopgap, but you equally carve out some time, perhaps in three or six months time, let's say, when you're going to get together with those same people and perhaps others too, and you're going to um, go into collaboration mode at that stage because you've all got the time and the energy to do that. But for some reason right now, you can't do it. So this is a good enough. So it's a great technique from that point of view. Of course, if you, owe, if you compromise too much, then of course you don't get the benefits of collaboration. Um, in particular, you never fully air those um, issues and explore the uh, problem fully, so you don't necessarily come up with an optimal solution that would actually stand the test of time. Uh, let me just let one more. No, I think we've got everybody here. Sorry, I thought there was somebody else joining the meeting. Um, 
So there are some disadvantages if it's your main tool that you use most of the time when you come up with arguments and disagreements, and therefore the fact that things are never fully resolved is a problem, okay? So less innovative, suboptimal solutions, potentially superficial understandings. These can be some of the difficulties of compromising too often. But it has, it is a useful tool um, and I would recommend it. Um, so particularly useful for lack of time, as I've said. Um, and again, think about for yourself, how often do you use this tool and is it working for you? Okay. For those people who've just joined the meeting, apologies, I don't know what happened at the beginning at four o'clock, but I've started recording the session because I didn't want to lose time and I must leave at five today. So you will get a recording of this so that you can catch up with the discussion. Uh, okay, let's carry on. So another technique then, now this um, was at the bottom left-hand corner of our model. So this is when we're not meeting our own needs and we're not meeting anybody else's needs. We are just avoiding the situation. And sometimes that can be a good thing. So it re can reduce stress, for example, um, perhaps the outlaws are coming for dinner and you suddenly remember you need really need to walk the dog. Um, it can be something that's useful for you. It can save time. Now, this is important at work, particularly if it's an issue that actually you don't really need to be pulled into. Sometimes at work, people will have a tendency to want to pull us into things to support them. And that may or may not be appropriate. That may or may not be a good use of our time. And there's also that other old saying about beware of people who make bullets for others to fire. You may find if you never avoid that you get pulled into things that you really shouldn't. So sometimes avoiding is sensible. And sometimes it can give you time. So it may be that you have a situation where I can't deal with this right now. I am so busy. I'm sorry, but I will speak to you next week, I promise. So you avoid them, as it were, but you tell them that's what you're doing. You're honest about it, but you're making a commitment to deal with the issue at a time when you sensibly can. So avoiding can be a benefit, but of course, it can also be a disadvantage. If we do this too much of the time, if we withdraw from other people, if we seem unapproachable, people come to bring us problems that really we should be helping them with, but we just don't seem to want to deal with it, either because we ignore them or we say, oh, thank you, leave that there, I'll get around to it, and we never do, then they frustrate. We frustrate those colleagues and our relationships start to break down and we will be seen in a poor light. So there can be resentment of our evasiveness declining working relationships, we may miss deadlines because people can't get their work completed. Um, there can be delays, frustration build up and very poor communication. So it has a lot of disadvantages, but occasionally it can be the right thing to use. So again, uh, think about how often do you think you avoid conflict because it's just too awkward and you don't want to deal with it and you don't know what to say and it's all going to get emotional and whatever. Whatever the reasons are, just think about if you're using it, why are you using it? Do you use it too often? And potentially, as I was mentioned with competing, we might avoid things, particularly if our confidence levels are low because we are afraid of handling the situation. We are afraid of the emotions that might be unleashed by that conversation. So think about if you're how often you use it and if you use it quite a lot, why that might be, because, again, dealing with that underlying reason will be the first step towards being more effective with dealing with conflict in the future. Sometimes it's great because you want to let sleeping dogs lie, but other times it's not. Sometimes it's because we're indecisive. Again, that would be the thing to tackle first, becoming more decisive, learning how to make good decisions, and then tackling the rest of the options you have around dealing with conflict more effectively. If you never use it at all, are you getting pulled into too much, into too many things? Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. I think those are the key things I wanted you to think about. And finally, that final quadrant, accommodating. So this was where we are very keen to meet other people's needs, but we are not looking after our own needs at all. We're not being at all assertive. We're being very passive, in fact. So are there any benefits to this? Yes, it's all about brownie points, isn't it, really? Being supportive, restoring harmony, building relationships. And if there is no high stakes for us, perhaps getting a quick ending, cutting our losses so we can move on. So there can be lots of benefits to being accommodating um, from time to time. But of course, if we're accommodating a lot of the time, we are not meeting our own needs. And that is a key disadvantage for it. We're sacrificing real concerns um, on matters of importance. And that might not only affect us, it might affect other people as well. It may lead to less loss of respect because we're too unassertive and we just seem like a doormat. Um, we may not, we may agree to do things because we want to be helpful, but then we've no motivation for really carrying it through. So then we're damaging ourselves twice. We're losing a sense of respect and self-worth and we don't even want to do what we've agreed to do. And other people are seeing that in us. So it's not very effective. And sometimes, as you might have answered um, for the question, is conflict ever a good thing? Actually, some healthy debate, some robust arguments are actually quite good. It gets things out in the fresh air, as it were, particularly, um, you know, things that have been niggling away at people. It can be really important that we actually do engage in some argument. It also, I uh, put here, denies the benefit of confrontation if unhealthy behaviours are accepted. Now, this is a key thing, and that can happen colleague to colleague or if you're a manager with a team member. Somebody's always late, or their work's never finished to a very good standard, and you just keep letting it go. Can you ever recover from that? Yes, you can. The key thing, the key technique there is what I call drawing a line in the sand. So really it's around having that conversation with somebody and saying to them, you know what, this needs to stop. I appreciate that I've never tackled you on your lateness before and I should have done, and I take full responsibility for that. But going forward, this has to stop. You're letting yourself down, you're letting the team down and letting me down. I need you to be here on time, whatever your shift patterns are. So going forward, I want this to change. Let's talk about that happening? Are there any difficulties? And then you can take the discussion from there. But by drawing a line in the sand, by accepting that you are complicit in what you've accepted for so long, you draw fire from somebody who might otherwise turn around and say, well, what are you complaining for? You've, you know, you've never complained before. Nobody else has. You take the initiative and it puts you on a better footing. So, um, Accommodating can be useful, but it can also be uh, a disadvantage. And again, think about if you're using it quite a lot, why that might be. So I've gone through and I'll just quickly flick back to the model we started with. I've gone through these five styles, key styles. Now, in any difficulty or disagreement you have, you may start off using one style, but quickly segue into another because as the conversation develops, you realize that you might need to. So you might start off in a situation whereby you start being very assertive, no, this is what's got to happen and why, but then your listening mode kicks in and you realize, actually, I need to backtrack a little. I need to start doing a little bit more listening and rather more collaborating. This situation is more complex than I thought it was, in which case you can then shift and move into that collaboration style merely by stopping talking and listening to others more and being genuinely interested in what they have to say. Equally, you might find that you want to collaborate, but you realize there isn't time. So you then say, look, I know ideally we would thrash this out for far longer, but what can we do as a quick and dirty solution to tide us over for now? So you may, this could be quite a fluid model. The, 
if you, when you've looked at all these styles and you've scored yourself as to how often you're using them, I generally find, if I've gone through a questionnaire with people, that around 60% of the people in the room with me will only be using a couple of styles the majority of the time. The rest will be using quite a good balance. So it's about realizing that by being able, getting comfortable with all of those styles, you're more effective in how you deal with conflict. You can be more fluid in your approach rather than just doing what you've always done because that's the way you do things. It does mean that you've got to be brave and try out different techniques than you've tried before. And that can take time. It might feel uncomfortable the first couple of times, but like going down to the gym if you haven't been for ages, you know, your muscles ache, it feels awkward, you don't know how all the equipment works. But if you stick with it and try it, you will find it gets easier and easier and you will start to get the benefits from it. So, um, so think about being more fluid in your approach and the benefits of that for you. If there are issues around either using these new techniques or you've realized looking at this and actually maybe your confidence isn't actually where it needs to be, or you're not as decisive as you need to be, something like that. And you need help dealing with those foundations first. Think about talking to a really good friend that you trust, your partner, perhaps a coach or a mentor that you have at work. Somebody who is dispassionate about the situation can be more helpful for you. With webinars like this, you can put forward tools and techniques, and it all sounds so easy. But of course, when you're in the moment, and particularly if you don't enjoy arguments at all, then it can feel very awkward indeed. And these sorts of tools maybe feel a little bit too glib. But you do need, that's because you're caught up in the emotion of it. And you do need to separate yourself from that and think about what the approach could be that you could take or should have taken. I should also add at this point that sometimes when we look at models like this and we think about our approach to conflict and difficulties and arguments, we start to realise that a lot of that is rooted in the conditioning we've had from quite an early age. You may be from a large family, rumbustious, where everybody has lots of debate and, and you have to shout to be heard and you're really comfortable with all of this. Or you may be from a much smaller family where it's quieter. Maybe your parents didn't like arguments and they shut arguments down because they didn't like disagreements. It can be quite hard then as an adult to start to learn these techniques, which is almost like they're starting from scratch. But it is important that we do learn to have arguments, healthy arguments, healthy debates, where we are assertive and we're talking about what our needs are, but equally Whenever possible, we are listening to what other people need as well, working together. I'll just flick back to where we were up to. And any questions? So there are a few people in the room. If you do have any questions, do please put that in the chat box. That would be great. Otherwise, I will carry on. As I said, those of you that haven't managed to join the meeting, if you want to ask me any questions, I'm on LinkedIn. Do please send me a message. I'd be very happy to answer any questions you have. OK. Let's move on then. So the next part of this I wanted to talk to you about is around influencing skills. The more influential we are and the better we are at stakeholder management, the fewer conflicts we are likely to experience at work because we understand the importance of these basic ground skills, if you like. So I've just done a quick sort of brain dump, as it were, of key things to think about as an HR professional for you to look through and think, to what extent does that apply to me? To what extent am I using this or understanding it? In HR, one of the key things is that we need to know how our organizations work. How does our organization, particularly if it has, well, it's a business, you have to make a profit. How do you make money? And equally, how do you lose it? So make sure that you start building your networks um, in the organization that you are. Never mind if you've been there for a few years and you've not been brave enough to do it. It's always a good time to start. Start to reach out to people, to other departments, 
talk to them about how they work, how they, the services they provide, the products they make, whatever it is, spend some time with them, get to know what they do, get some time with the managers about the difficulties from an HR perspective that they face, see it, the walk the walk as it, as it were, see things at the shop floor level. You will build connections, you will build your understanding, and you will start to gain the reputation of somebody who is interested in the business and wants to help, wants to be a business partner. Whatever your official title is, you have a business brain and you are interested in business and how it works. And that's equally true if you're in the nonprofit sector as well. It's still very important that you know where money is, how money is used, how it can be saved, how it can be um, lost, as it were. Be curious. Ask a lot of questions. Brush up your listening skills. Ask other people, how good am I as a listener, actually? Because sometimes we think we're a lot better than we are. So it's good to get some feedback. Ask for feedback around your performance, but be specific about what it is, rather than just say, how do you think I'm doing? That's such an open question. Where do we even start with that? Much better to say, how do you think I handled that meeting? Do you think I had the right style and approach? Did I come across well? Was I convincing with my arguments? That sort of thing. Building relationships with a wide range of people across the organization I've touched on. Know who your stakeholders are and engage with them regularly. Okay, that's going to make life a lot easier for you. Keep your professional experience up. Keep your self-confidence high. Um, and start to talk about what your successes are, but find a way to do this that feels comfortable for you. So when you get that great question, oh, hi, how's it going? Rather than just saying, fine, well, I haven't learned very much from that, have I? Say, oh, I've had a great week, I've just managed two, and tell them what it is. Think of it as a headline in a newspaper. You are just lobbing out a little headline there. Now, if they're interested, they'll ask you more. If they don't ask you about it, you've at least lobbed out the headline and once you've done that a number of times people will get to know what it is you do all day as the children's book says they start to realize the value that you're adding it doesn't have to be big things it could be small things recruiting for a difficult position oh, i finally managed to make an offer on something i was so pleased working with such and such it was really great fun how's your week been always remember to reciprocate and ask others how are they but utilize those little opportunities when people say how are you how's it going rather than just a fine or okay tell them just that little bit more if they want the rest of the story under the headline they can ask you can't they otherwise you can just leave it where it is but it's a way of talking about yourself which isn't boastful so really ask yourself how influential am i and actually what could i be doing to make sure that i'm more influential and the key thing here is that then when you want to bring new initiatives forward in HR, you've got a network of people that you can start to talk to. So for example, um, I was going to introduce a new appraisal system when I was working at a company. And as, as is often the case, appraisals, lots of managers hated them. Do we have to do them? There were lots of moans and so on. And we had a pretty awful system. Having found one I thought would suit us, I then made sure that the company came in and get, gave a demo pitch to managers across the organisation that might use it. And in particular, I asked all of the people I knew would be the most critical, that hated appraisers and thought we should just get rid of them altogether. Because in doing that, I was drawing their fire. If people are going to be critical, they're going to be critical anyway. You may as well find out early on what their criticisms are and take them on board. And in doing so, I could hear what they liked and disliked about this system. I got the system tweaked. And then when we launched it, it landed really well. There was the buy-in for it because people were talking about it. They could see the changes we'd made. They felt part of the solution. And it was the easiest implementation of a system I think I've ever been through. So rather than avoid the awkward squad because you know, oh, I know what they're going to say and I just don't need it, make the flack, let them open fire. Because unless you're, unless you're employing idiots in your organizations, and I doubt that's the case, their criticisms may be uncomfortable at times, but it will be real. And you may as well hear it early on. So you've got um, a way of using that. 
okay, using it in a positive way. So think about your influencing skills because it will help you, it will help reduce the conflicts you come up against at work and therefore make life easier for you. Stakeholder management, very much a part of that. Thinking about who your key stakeholders are, who will support your initiatives or undermine them if they're not on board. And this is particularly important if you're going to take um, a pretty major piece of work to a management committee, a board meeting, wherever that might be. You want to make sure before you do it that you've been around and all of your stakeholders, you know who's for you, rooting for you, and equally who isn't. And how are you going to handle those people that are not in favour of your proposal? You need to go into that meeting fully prepared. Unless you have a majority of people that are supporting you, don't take the paper to that meeting. You still have work to do. In this way, you are containing potential conflict because you're dealing with things early on. You're laying the groundwork, making sure that you have won people over, that you've understood their needs and you know, either met them or met help them realize why they can't be met in this particular instance, but your initiative should still go ahead. So when those supporters first, and when you've got a majority with you, then you put that proposal to the table, knowing that it will be passed. You're taking, the, taking out the conflict element by dealing with it through consultation, collaboration, and consultation early on. So again, that means that when it comes to the conflicts at work, what you should be left with if you're good at influencing, good at stakeholder management, are those issues that arise that are unforeseen. And that's when that model I've shared with you comes in useful because you can be thinking about what techniques do you usually use? What ones should you use more often? Get that practice in and how do you respond? What would be the best way to respond in this situation? So you give yourself the best of um, opportunity to be successful in that situation and at least handle the situation if not completely to your satisfaction in a way where you feel you have done the best you can and um, people will respect the position that you've taken okay so I think that was all that I wanted to say on that um, recommended books from me so there are two here getting to yes this is Again, an old book. It's actually all about negotiating, but it's a classic and it's still worth reading. The key premise in this book is if you want other people to understand you, then you first have to seek to understand them. Because only then, when you've listened and paid attention, will people start to listen to you. That's the essence of that book. A book that was published last year, Conflicted, a really good read on lots of modern research around arguments, why we have them, why they're good for us, and how we can manage conflict in a healthy way to get great outcomes. And guess what? The essence of this book at the end of the day, if you want other people to understand you, you have to seek to understand them first and get them comfortable with you before they're going to accept you and your arguments. So hey, two great books, both worth reading, both published 40 years apart, but the essence is the same because human nature doesn't really change. That's why Shakespeare's plays still resonate and we still like Jane Austen's books. Things like this, you know, the emotions around conflicts, arguments, disagreements are not styles. They don't sort of go in and out of fashion. It is what it is. And learning to deal with it well is the best thing we can do. Okay, I think then that brings us to the end of this um, end of this presentation. Um, apologies again to people who couldn't join us before. I don't know what happened with the link with Eventbrite and Zoom, but this presentation has been fully recorded. It will go out to you, to all of those of you who have um, joined us. And um, I'm very happy to take any questions from people on LinkedIn um, when that can happen. OK, I've got a lot of people now coming into the meeting, ironically, as we're about to, um, to finish. So, so sorry about that. I really just don't know what happened there. Um, so if 
I'll stop sharing now, I think. If there are any quick questions, we've got about 50 to about 10 minutes if anybody does want to ask me any quick questions about things. But otherwise, I think the best thing is uh, to pick up the recording um, when you can after today. So if you want to put anything quickly in the chat box, please do. No? Struggled with the link, yes. I know, I don't know um, what happened there. Yes, the recordings will be made available afterwards, absolutely. Um, and uh, I hope that you find it useful. And as I said before, I'm on LinkedIn, so if you want to send me any messages or ask me any questions, that's absolutely fine. I don't mind at all. Um, just apologies again for the whole thing. But thank you for those who did join me. That was great. I was really here at four o'clock thinking, gosh, I'm the only person in this meeting and about 200 people signed up for it. Something's clearly gone wrong. So there you go. Um, it's been great doing the webinar. Uh, shame that you couldn't be actually live with me, but I've enjoyed recording it for you. I hope you find it useful and wish you all the very best. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Have a good evening.